The old Kant calls boredom horror vacui, and that is the horror of inner void. Boredom, he writes in the anthropology, is disgust with oneself. Thus, the self-referential subject has the perfect duty to itself to make sure no boredom ever occurs, for that is but disgust. Kant already appears to see a great boredom of late modern man on the horizon that amounts but to disgust, a disgust that must be chased out, as, or shall we say that must be entertained. The Hodo Vacui is present in Kant's philosophy because it is foundational for the age to come, for the Hodo Vacui, I would say, opens up the new age. In the introduction to the phenomenology of spirit, Hegel sees the rise of a new age indicated by the simultaneous occurrence of the phenomena of boredom and carelessness. Boredom emerges as spirit falls out of itself with its having become. Boredom emerges together with a certain silliness, an ironic cold distance from the world. Thus already Hegel implies boredom to be the mood of our age. It was Nietzsche who carried the burden of being the great destroyer, who thought of modern man as disgusted and bored to tears with himself. This man he called the last man, who flattens the earth, indulges in nihilism and hedonism and knows of no greater goals beyond himself. I quote from Nietzsche, the fundamental fact of human will, of its horror vacui, as Nietzsche writes in the genealogy of morality, is that it quote, needs a goal and it rather wills the nothing than not willing at all. One, if not the goal of this age, is the installment of a global management system. I quote from Nietzsche, once we have that overall economic management of the earth, which is inevitably in store, humanity can find its best sense as a machinery at the service of this management, as an uncanny wheelwork of ever smaller, ever more finely adapted wheels, end of quote. In this state, the human being, Nietzsche argues elsewhere in the unpublished notebooks, will be very interested indeed, albeit only epidermally interested. Put differently, always slightly bored, nothing gets under our skin, or we're always desiring to be entertained further and further. But is boredom not just an accidental mood we all have just from time to time? How could it be the mood of an entire our age? Are we all, as it were, infected or affected by it? But surely we are not bored all the time, are we? How could anyone claim that boredom is the fundamental mood of an age? In The Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics, a lecture course held in 1929, Heidegger asks, and I quote, Does it ultimately hold true for us that a profound boredom draws back and forth like a silent fog in the abysses of Dasein. Building on being in time, this lecture course further explores the notion of Stimmung, mood in its ontological sense. Heidegger's aim is to awaken the mood of our age. This attempt, quote, ultimately falls together with the demand to completely transform our understanding of the human being. The transformation of the human being, which is ultimately Heidegger's project, takes place primarily in language and in listening. In the German word Stimmung, we can hear the nominalization of the verb Stimmen, which means to tune. Stimmen is also the stem of the verb Bestimmen, which means to determine. In Stimmung, Heidegger thus does not hear the contingent state of someone's psychology, but more fundamentally, Dasein's fundamentally determined way of being in the world. Moods need not be conscious states, Heidegger argues. Most of the time, we might even believe that we are not in any particular mood, for it cannot be formulated as a concrete experience. There might not be an accurate adjective to describe it anyways. Nonetheless, Heidegger continues, mood is always there. It is there because mood attunes Dasein, Einstimmen, Bestimmen. Hence mood might not be good enough a translation, but attunement would be. Man is, Heidegger argues, never not attuned, never not gestimmt. Thus attunements 
are ontologically, not something present at hand in the soul or a state of mind. They are not psychological states or feelings, but they belong to the essence of the human being. For Heidegger, mood, or let's say attunement, is hence a, quote, fundamental way of Dasein as that which grants Dasein continuous and possibility. Heidegger gives an example of a deeply sad fellow human being who withdraws and is no longer as open as they might once have been with us. The how of our relationship with them changes. Being with one another is changed fundamentally. We enter into their sadness with them. The attunement, Heidegger writes, and I quote, lies down on everything and everyone around him. That means it that mood of sadness encompasses everything. It is all comprehensive. It is not primarily a state of the soul or of the suffering or grief, a grieving fellow man. Yet, it is not somewhere outside either. Heidegger assures, but the mood, the attunement is itself, quote, the how of our being with another Dasein. The how is relational. It makes up our relationships and as such determines bestimmt being with others. That is, it is the very ground of an articulation of the sadness of the grieving person. And the mood does not spread like an infection from one psyche to another. They are not accompanying symptoms, accidents of the subject, as it were, but are always already there. And I quote from Heidegger again, a, a, an attunement is a, a weise, a melody, you could almost say, a mode or a way, not just a mere form, but a tune in the sense of a melody, which does not hover a, a, above man's presence, but gives the tone for that being. Heidegger then cautiously calls mood a medium within which Dasein takes place, within which our existence takes place. We have now already moved further down into the dimension of fundamental attunements, which primarily is not at all some immediate effective state. Think of the death of a loved one, that that death shakes us fundamentally and disrupts our ways of being. A certain heaviness lies down upon the how of our ways of living, our relationships, even when we are not aware of it, it is still there. In a similar way, the fundamental attunement of an age is there and not there in a sense, because we are not maybe perfectly aware of it. But this does not mean that this there and not there are at odds. They do not sort of sublate each other or cancel each other, because this is not a dialectical way of thinking. Rather, they belong together Equi primordially or co-originally. There is no there without the not there. Again, the task of Heidegger's lecture series here is to awaken within his listeners, his students in the hall in Freiburg, the fundamental attunement of the epoch. What is our fundamental attunement that can at times be felt, at other times not, which is however there without being permanently or perfectly present? Which would be there even though its precise opposite might rule the day. We might all feel very entertained and quite happy. Heidegger turns to four examples of cultural philosophy at his time, and I'm only going into Spengler's uh, Decline of the West, that prophesies that life would suffer decline effectuated by spirit. To um, Another example by Heidegger is Klage, who understands the spirit as the antagonist of the body. Then there's Max Scheler's attempt at an equilibrium of the two, and there's Siegel's attempt at a sublation or cancellation of the dichotomy of body and mind. All of these interpretations are, of our age, Heidegger argues, are based on Nietzsche's distinction of the Dionysian and Apollinian. More precisely, on Nietzsche's life affirmation that wants to affirm all aspects of life, even, quote, the most terrifying, the most ambiguous, the most fraudulent. All of them understand a similar distinction to be the fundamental problem. And that is the mind-body distinction. That's the battle of body and mind, life and spirit, this worldly world and the ideal world beyond the world of metaphysics. It's the struggle of irrationality against rationality. And their writings, the writings of cultural philosophers, as Heidegger calls them, are a reflection of an age of diremption, to use that Hegelian term, that uh, 
that manifests itself in the subject-object dichotomy, sort of an alienation to speak with a Marxist term. Heidegger, however, and this is crucial, understands that this distinction is already formulaic, and that means it's encrusted, there's no longer really truth to that because it's encrusting us and there, there's no, it, it, it gets at something but it doesn't get to the heart of the problem. It sees that something's off, that something's wrong, that people are bored with life but at the same time there's a certain maybe dec decline or decadence at work um, but then again this is just formulaic, they don't get to the heart of the problem and Heidegger tries to do that by going into the mood of the age rather than a subject-object dichotomy. That means that we can forever quarrel about which part, the body, the mind, reason, unreason, desire uh, or rationality should take lead or should, should be the guiding principle. Um, but this itself is no longer an original distinction, thinks Heidegger. The fact that it is now formulaic indicates that this is a byproduct of diremption itself. They all of these philosophers see something is fundamentally wrong, as I said before, but they are not radical enough in their approach. Heidegger argues that cultural philosophy ultimately fails to address the fundamental problem of modernity since it asks where do we stand, instead of asking how do things stand with us and why would that matter. It matters because we can no longer seem to find meaning in our lives. For Heidegger, this is an indication that we have become insignificant to ourselves, and I quote from Heidegger, why do we not find meaning for us anymore? That is an essential possibility of being. Is it because an indifference, a Gleichgültigkeit, a sameness, yawns at us out of all things, an indifference whose ground we do not know, end of quote. And this is precisely because we have, and Heidegger thinks, this is a quote again from him, this is precisely because we have become bored bored with ourselves. We no longer have a sense of wonder about the world, but we feel the horror of the void in us, the horror vacui. We are bored with things and there's a, we are massing things all over the place, but there's no sense of amazement that you could see, for example, with Aristotle, with Ithamatsain, that is the spark that, that triggers philosophy. And we have become bored with things in their simplicity. And so we long for the next you know, superlative, the next best, greatest thing. Thus the fundamental attunement of our epoch is boredom, which in German means Langeweile, a long-lasting while where time stretches and expands into the infinite, into the infinite negative and the infinite positive, and we want to kill time. This is an expression that we have now. If boredom is the fundamental attunement of our time, then this means not only that we are fundamentally bored, but also that this epoch will last very long. The last man lives longest, says Nietzsche's Zarathustra. This epoch is far from over, and we, what we saw was already present in Kant and Hegel and in Heidegger, and it now plays itself out. According to Heidegger, cultural philosophy appears at best to be able to show that something is weird about this age of us. Or at worst, cultural philosophy might even enforce the problems of modernity. How so? Well, because by offering sort of an exit from it, but more, but not really giving an exit or an escape possibility, but just reinforcing what's going on anyways. And therefore I ask, can cultural output like TV shows or movies or music, songs, can they express a proper exit, escape, or are they actually just reinforcing the machine? So, I offer three examples. The first example is the film Network from 1976. Network portrays the emergence of reality TV, something that we've come accustomed to quite a bit. The main character is called Howard Beale. He's a veteran news anchorman in New York City who is about to lose his job and loses his mind over the fact. He goes on live television, he's drunk and is, you know, he's close to a mental breakdown, he's half naked, wet from the rain, and he blasts out, and I quote from the film, I don't have to tell you things are bad, everybody knows things are bad, it's a depression. We know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat, it's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and to this I add 
Bill doesn't say this, but obviously our worlds are getting larger and larger virtually because more and more access to everything. And I continue with Bill, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV. Bill wants his viewers to get mad, to open the windows and scream, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. One can hear in his call for madness, which in German means Verrücktheit, which means to be displaced, to be dislodged, the attempt to break, to break away fun fundamentally from the current age. The ratings are through the roof. And Beale is offered his own new show where he's allowed to spout wild prophecies and speculations about the insanity of our age and the coming apocalypse. Beale's show is greatly amusing and entertaining. Thus, Beale's original attempt to break out of the system and away from it, from this age, has itself been broken up and actually is now feeding back into the machine, feeding the very machine he wanted to rage against. Beale is so successful at what he does that even his that even his critique, or maybe it's precisely because it is a critique, leads to growth and more output. Unbeknownst to Beale himself, towards the end of the film, Beale is approached by Arthur Jensen, CEO of the network that Beale works for. Jensen reveals to Beale the real truth, as he sees it, of the brave new world that's about to emerge, where there will be no countries, but only corporations. It is Beale's holy duty to preach the Evangel. And I quote Jensen, And our children will live, Mr. Beale, to see that perfect world in which there is no war or famine, oppression or brutality, one vast ecumenical holding company, for whom all men will work to serve a common profit, in which all men will hold a share of stock, all necessities provided, all anxieties tranquilized, all boredom amused. I now turn to the second example, which is Kurt Cobain's and Nirvana's attempt at a heavy and desperate break into the 1990s, an attempt to break away from the cool decade of the 1980s, the decade of the American psycho of Phil Collins and Gordon Gecko. In the song Smells Like Teen Spirit, which seems to sing of a possibility for the rise of another spirit, Cobain demands, and I quote, here we are now, entertain us. They are already bored with the entertainment provided by reality TV, which is at that time barely 15 years old. They are nonetheless greedy for more. Another line reads, and I quote, she's overboard and self-assured. The term Nirvana, of course, is taken from Buddhism and means nothingness. The band Nirvana would itself become an important part of the uncanny wheelwork. All boredom amused, or with Nietzsche, all boredom managed. And the fact that Cobain killed himself at the mysterious age of 27 has helped increase sales and secure the status of a consumerist countercultural icon. Another example is an episode of the first season of the television series Black Mirror, a title that speaks for itself. In episode 2 of season 1, a dystopian future is portrayed where young people live in isolated cells where they have to watch TV, or play a video game, or listen to music. In short, they are and have to be amused and entertained at all times. There is no room for boredom at all. During the day, they have to ride bikes while staring at a screen. They collect digital money so that at some point they might have saved up enough to in order to spend it on a ticket required to take part in a television talent show that's quite reminiscent of Britain's Got Talent. They never see daylight, only screens. All they know is the digital. One of the talent show participants goes mad. He threatens to kill himself on live television and holds a poignant speech about the emptiness and meaninglessness of their lives. He is subsequently offered a job to do just that. By that I mean, he's offered a job to give poignant, angry speeches every single night on TV about just how messed up everything is. His reward is to live in a penthouse apartment where he can look outside and see real trees and the sun. 
And it's just a side note, but this is very reminiscent of Plato's cave. But still, he's not really outside. He's still trapped. His windows, where he's looking at you know, the real trees and the sun, they might just be better HD screens. There is no escape, Black Mirror tells us here, from the transcendental theater. For anything we do keeps feeding back into the machine and results in a positive feedback loop. These examples tell us that products of culture seem to fail similarly like cultural philosophy has failed. And even more to the point, both deliver us from us, from our burden, by entertaining us, by preaching the obvious. They even require superficial boredom that can easily be stilled to keep the uncanny wheelwork of the total economic management of the earth going. Boredom is the fuel it burns while never allowing for deep boredom to arise. Heidegger thus sees in an esoteric book written 10 years after that uh, lecture course I was quoting from before, that the goal of the technological world seems to be, quote, a state of total boredom, superficial boredom, not deep boredom, which begs to be amused and entertained and does not give rise to deep boredom. It needs boredom to be entertained, which leads to more boredom, boredom which then can be entertained further. Cultural products even when they declare themselves to be subversive, fail to transform fundamentally, for they do not allow deep boredom to take place. They only perpetuate the transcendental horror show. We have seen a few aspects now of the manifold phenomenon boredom. As it is the fundamental achievement of our age, according to Heidegger, Heidegger then does not call for the eradication of boredom or for the entertainment of it nor does he call to action against boredom. Because that would lead to total amusement, which requires total superficial boredom. What then can Heidegger offer us? Well, he speaks of a waiting, which is determined, and I quote from him, as an essential asking by Dasein itself to let oneself be attuned through and through by boredom so as to hear something essential from that experience. And we saw quite the opposite with Kant. In fact, the Kantian equation of boredom with disgust with oneself is precisely, I think, what drives our subjectivistic economy of boredom and desire. Are we then to remain passive or numb with Heidegger? No, I don't think so. To quote from Heidegger, we can ask whether our being human is not constituted in everything in such a way that we work against the possibility of the rise of that profound boredom in all our doing. And I try to show that this is what's happening in cultural output. But allowing profound boredom could open a dimension of original temporality for Heidegger. And that means the freedom of Dasein. An age of all boredom amused could then be considered an age of great unfreedom, right? So by allowing great or profound boredom to take place, we become free.